lesson number four. I want to read verse number one through six. And uh, our subject this morning, I've entitled the sermon, True or False? Let's all stand together in honor of the reading of God's word. The Bible says in the book of 1 John in chapter number uh, four, in verses one through six, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know that the, by this, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You may be seated. Father in heaven, we come today in Jesus' name, and we thank you for the opportunity given to us to come together as people of faith, uh, to worship and to uh, exalt the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, today as we approach this message to present it to the people that you have uh, presented before us, we just ask that you anoint us with the Holy Spirit of God. Help me as I uh, communicate this passage to those that are here. And I pray that we will hear these truths and we will understand them, receive them, and incorporate them into our daily lives. We ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. In the book of 1 John, in chapter number 4, we're beginning a, ba a brand new chapter, uh, beginning in verse number 1 all the way down to verse number 6. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And when we read that, it kind of sends a message to us, or it sends us a signal as to what John is going to be discussing in these six verses. For example, there are two forces today that are at work in the world. Two forces that are at work in the world. There is the spirit of truth that is at work in the world, and also there's the spirit of error that is at work in the world. You see those things going on every day. And I think the fact that we've gotten kind of used to the way things are, we kind of ignore some of the things that's happening in our world today. But when we think about the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, these two are opposites and they work to counsel each other out. For example, when God begins to do a great work, the devil shows up to oppose and hinder that work. And even though Satan is at work to hinder the work of God uh, and that goes on through in the church, Jesus has promised that the devil's work will fail and his work will continue to change the lives of people. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 16, verse number 8, Jesus said this, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Uh, if you remember in the book of Acts, the church was experiencing a mighty movement of God. People were coming to Jesus Christ to, to be saved by the thousands. Uh, what happened? Uh, did the devil take a back seat and said, well, you know, there's nothing else I can do. I've got to stay out of the way and let God do his things. Absolutely not. The devil did not pull back. He did not go into hiding. Uh, he countered by getting into the church, and he tempted a couple to lie about an offering that they had given to the church. And later Peter would ask them, why did, notice this, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You see, the devil saw a great work of God uh, going on, and he involved himself in that work to try to hinder that work. And still he is doing that even today. Satan also was behind the great persecution which came upon the church in order to completely destroy any advancement or forward moving of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, when all of this failed to stop the powerful movement of God through his church, false teachers, they entered the church uh, with their message of deception. 
And this brought questions among believers because, you know, there was the message of truth that was being spread in the church, and there was the message of error being spread in the church. And those that were preaching the message of truth, they were exalting the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were emphasizing his identity and his deity. And then the false teachers, they were on the scene to explain away the identity of Christ and the deity of Christ. And so it left people that were showing up in church wondering what is the truth. They wondered who should we really believe. And so when we begin to think about it today, the work of Satan, we oftentimes emphasize that the work of Satan is going on in the world but let me tell you something, Satan has made his way into many uh, congregations with this message of deception. And when we think about it, the devil at work in the world, the devil at work in the church, let me tell you something, he is at work everywhere to deceive. Even today, it's so important for us to listen to every sermon, every teaching with open ears and open heart and an open Bible. Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. We must be very careful to listen to the, to the message and the messenger that's going out. And I want to encourage you, be careful not to drift off onto another planet while the messenger is bringing the message. Be careful to listen to everything that's being said because we have to consider some things. Are they bringing forth the truth or, or what they're bringing to, through is it error? Now, what we want to deal with this morning is very important. For example, how can we discern truth from error? How can we know when that messenger is speaking the truth or when he is using deception to spread error in the church. Well, in the book of 1 John, chapter number 3 and verse number 24, as John concludes that chapter, he kind of tells us how we are able to discern between truth and error. For example, notice in verse number 24, it says, Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him, and by this we know he abides in us, and here it is. By the Spirit whom he has given us, it is through the leadership of the Holy Spirit that is at work in your life and mine that helps us to be identify what is true and what is of error. Now, what I'm going to do in this sermon today is twofold. I want us to think about, number one, the spirit of error, and then I want us to consider the spirit of truth. Because in these six verses, John dealt with both. He dealt with the spirit of error, and he dealt with the spirit of truth. And let's consider, first of all, the spirit of error. Notice what he says in verse number one. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, the first part of the instructions here, for us, John says don't believe everything that you hear. And, and you know, there's a lot of times people will go away uh, from a, a, a lesson or a message or a sermon, and they'll go away thinking, boy, they know a lot about the Bible. But if you were to look very closely at what they said, it, it was a message that was uh, intended to deceive as to who Jesus Christ is. And so what John tells us is not to believe everything we hear, but second of all, notice he said, but test the spirit. Now, to test the spirit, it requires a thorough, precise, and meticulous examination to determine if the message or the messenger is genuine or and of God. Now, I want to kind of explain this to you. How do we test that message? And, and how do we look and ask ourselves the question, is what I'm hearing really true? There's three questions we have to ask ourselves. Uh, when the message is being preached and the messenger is bringing it forth, number one, we have to ask ourselves, what do they preach? It is not what is new. It is what is true. And we live in a world today when people are searching for new things. You, you know, uh, the, the, the thing that's happening and, 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 you know, the going thing. You know, it, it's not what is new, but what is true. If you remember in the book of Acts in chapter number 17, 
in verse number 21, it says, For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Large crowds are drawn away and gathered together because of their desire to hear something new. And those who are genuine in their faith are, are not into this new age philosophy, but they stick with the tested and proven theology of Scripture. And that's what John is challenging this body of believers to, uh, to do. John says, beware of the content of the message. What are they saying about Jesus Christ? Who do they say he is? That is key. If you're going to detect error in the message of the messenger. You see, the content of the message they preach must be in line with the truth of Scripture, especially in relationship to the teaching of Jesus Christ. In the book of 1 John, chapter number 4, in verse number 3, notice this. John says, every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Skip down to verse number five. He says they are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world hears them. So I want to tell you something about the message that is preached by the messenger. The message that tickles the world's ear is one that is for the world. And the message that penetrates the heart is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is not meant to tickle the ears. The target is much lower. The target is the heart. The gospel message should penetrate the heart of the believer. And the intent here is so that lives will be changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Question number one, if we're going to detect error in the message, in the message of the messenger, we have to ask, what do they preach? And then number two, we have to ask, how do they live? How do they live? What are they preaching? How do they live? And the whole point here is we want to be able to detect error. Notice in the book of Matthew in chapter number 7, Jesus had this to say in verse number 15. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. In other words, they look like everybody else. You know, they are probably going to be singing some of the same songs, saying some of the same things. They come in sheep's clothing. But notice, inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Jesus says something important here. And I think all of us are aware of what he's talking about. Jesus said you cannot look on the outside and determine what is on the inside, what's in the heart, but sooner or later what is on the inside will reveal itself on the outside. Often, the messengers who have a message of error because of doctrinal compromise by these false teachers, usually it is followed by moral compromise. We see that displayed in so many today. Listen, a public performance is much easier to maintain than a private devotion. However, it is our private devotion which fuels our public performance. And so when we're trying to detect error, we have to ask that question, what are they preaching? We have to ask ourselves even a more personal question, how do they live? Does how they live line up with the scripture they preach or they teach? That's what John is saying in this passage of scripture. And listen to another warning that was given to us by our Lord. He said in the book of Matthew in chapter number 23, 
Verse 24, blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean also. The point that we're trying to drive home this morning and what John wanted those who were in his audience to see is this. How do you discern the spirit of error? Because the spirit of error was working in the world. And the spirit of error had come into the church. And this body of believers had been unsettled in their faith. They didn't know what to believe. And so question number one, what do they preach? Question number two, how do they live? But then question number three, what are they selling? And we're talking about those who are bringing a message of error. In verse number 5 of 1 John chapter 4, it says, They are of the world, these false messengers. Therefore, they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. Did you see how John puts all this stuff? False prophets come to you with an agenda to advance their prosperity rather than an agenda to advance the kingdom of God. They always have something to sell. They are more interested in you helping them to become rich than they are about reaching lost people for Christ. And, you know, we see so often many of these false messengers spend so much time promoting themselves, so much time uh, trying to target the financial means of those that are listening to them. Listen, if making them rich means making you poor, they are okay with that. That's a spirit of error. It is a false message uh, coming from a false messenger. False prophets always have something to sell. A false teacher does it for personal gain, not for the furtherance of the gospel. Our agenda as messengers of God, is to not to promote ourselves, but to promote our Lord. Our agenda as messengers of God is to make clear a presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ that promotes Jesus Christ in such a way that people would understand who he is and move toward him from salvation. The purpose of our Lord was to carry the gospel to everyone. If you remember, Jesus had peculiar, let me use another word, particular habits of prayer. For example, sometimes he would go up into the mountains alone to pray. Sometimes he would get up early in the morning to go and pray. And on one such morning, Jesus Christ had gotten up early to go and pray. And then when the disciples got up, they began to look for him and didn't know where he was at. And so they went out searching. You know, where did he go? What's he doing? And the Bible says in the book of Mark in chapter number 1, verse number 38, when they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. And the reason they were looking for Jesus is because the day before, he had performed many miracles. He had healed sick. He had ministered to those that had various needs. And so now everybody's looking for him. But notice what Jesus said. He said unto them, let us go into the next towns. What For what? That I may preach there also because for, notice this, this purpose I have come forth. A message of error usually promotes the messenger. A message of truth, it will promote the agenda of the Lord Jesus Christ, making known who he is to all who need to know him. And in the book of Luke in 19, uh, verse number 10, for the Son of Man, Jesus says, has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That should be the agenda of every messenger of God, bringing a message of hope to those who sit in a lost condition. John says, beware false prophets. 
without a kingdom agenda. Those who are only interested in advancing their own cause. John warns about the spirit of error, but then he writes about the spirit of truth. Notice in verse number 2 of 1 John chapter number 4, he says, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And I want to say three things as I try to develop this idea of the spirit of truth. First of all, the spirit of truth, it recognized the deity of Christ. What a person believes about Jesus is not just an important question. It's not just an interesting question. It is a foundational question. It's a fundamental question. If you'll remember, Jesus was walking through the regions of Caesarea Philippi. It was a place that was filled with idolatry. And they were probably images of God everywhere or, or images of these false gods everywhere. And so it caused our Lord to ask him, his disciples a question. Notice in Matthew 16, 13, it says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Listen, what we believe about scripture is important. And what we believe about church is also important. But what we believe about Jesus Christ and who he is is foundational. It's fundamental if it's going to be life-changing. The question to ask somebody is not do you believe in Jesus Christ. That's not the question. Because there's a lot of people today, you will ask them, do you believe in Jesus Christ? They'll say, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. The question is this. Who do you say that he is? That's the question. Because that's the question that Jesus asked. He didn't ask, hey, does everybody believe in me? He says, who is everybody saying that I am? You see, the seven-day Adventists, they will tell you that they believe in Jesus. However, they do not believe that he was God. And the Mormons, they will tell you that they believe in Jesus. But they do not believe that he is God. And the Jehovah Witnesses, they will tell you that they believe in Jesus, but they do not believe that he is God. When Jesus asked that question, who do people say that I am? Peter gave the answer. Peter answered the question Jesus asked. He said, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus told Peter, you got it right. You got it right. Because God revealed that truth to you. And you see, the message of truth is different from the message of error. The message of truth, it always recognizes the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know where a messenger stands, don't ask him, do you believe in Jesus? Ask him, who do you think Jesus is? If he says, well, you know, there's a lot of people who say, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I believe he was a good man. I believe he was a good teacher. I believe that he lived and he died, but a lot of people cannot go that very important next step and say, I believe that he is risen from the grave and that he is seated at the right hand of the Father and he's coming again. You see, that's why we cannot drift out on a, another planet when the word of God is being expounded. We must listen very carefully to the message to make sure it is the message of truth and not a message of error. The spirit of truth not only recognizes the deity of Christ, but the spirit of truth rejoices in the Holy Spirit. In verse number 4 of 1 John chapter number 4, listen to what John says to his audience. He said, you are of God. You are of God. He had talked about those who were of the world. Did you notice that? That was a popular phrase. Those that were of the spirit of error, they were the, of the world. But those that were of the spirit of truth, they were of God. And notice he goes on to say, little children... 
and have overcome them. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. God's desire is that you and I not only be saved, but he wants to dwell within us by the power and the presence of his Holy Spirit. God's presence with us, it draws us to him. And it draws us to the truth, that life-changing truth. His presence within us, it helps us to detect error. And it not only helps us to detect error, but it helps us to defeat Satan. This is the reason for us to rejoice. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. The spirit of truth, it recognizes the deity of Christ. The spirit of truth that rejoices in the Holy Spirit in the presence of him. And then finally, the spirit of truth, it responds to the word of God. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 John chapter number 4 in verse number 6. Again, he says, we are of God. And then he adds something. He who knows God hears us. In the Gospel of John, in chapter number 8, in verse number 47, it says this. He who is of God hears God's word. Therefore, you do not hear, Jesus said, because you are not of God. The spirit of truth, it responds to the word of God. Those who are of the truth, they listen to the truth. Those who are of the truth, they rejoice in the truth. Those who are of the truth apply the truth to their lives. Those who uh, know the truth are set free by that truth. Those who know Jesus Christ as personal Savior have a great love for him and his word. Our desire is to stay true to all we learn from Scripture. God's word always trumps popular opinion. And God's word always stirs our heart and provides direction for our lives. There is only one hope for salvation and security, and that hope is found in God's word through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes through the word of God. What do you believe about Jesus Christ? Who do you say that he is? Is what you believe true, or is what you believe false? Jesus Christ is God's son who came to reveal God to us, and he gave his life on the cross so that you and I could be forgiven. He came to give us life, but not just life, but to give it to us more abundantly. Have you received that truth? Have you surrendered your life to him? If you haven't, he's calling you, even today, to come and to surrender your life to him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you've allowed us to be here. We thank you for the word of God, the precious promises of scripture that give us hope. And I want to pray for those that might be present today that's never received you as their personal savior. I want to pray that they'll have courage to come and ask you to be their savior, to surrender their lives to you. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We will stand together.